Thanks, everybody. Welcome to Build. I'm your host, Ricky Camilleri. Uh, our next guests are the stars and director of the beautiful new film, Giant Little Ones. It's the story of a teenager that is struggling with everybody else's identity issues. Let's take a look. I was thinking I could stay overnight at your place after your birthday party. Dude, these girls want it just as much as you guys do. She's hot and she wants to spend the night. Couldn't be more perfect, Frankie. Got you something. Let's play again. we best friends for most of our lives. There's nothing you can't tell me. Wait. Never would have happened if we weren't wasted. You and Ballas did something that straight guys don't normally do. What are you doing? Moving the lockers? What for? What the hell do you think? Your dad's here. You know, I have a pretty good idea of what you're going through. I thought it was supposed to be acceptable these days for kids to experiment. Isn't that the kind of thing your type likes? <laughs> He's just doing what he's always done. Jess is running around making sure everyone knows her boyfriend's straight. Can I walk to school with you? You realize that together we make one giant target, right? I don't like my sister being used. Just so people think you're in a girl. Things change. Close friendships can change. What are you so afraid of? like you had experience with somebody you really loved. Could be that simple. I suggest you just pay attention to who you're drawn to. And don't worry too much about what to call it. Everybody, please put your hands together from giant little ones, Josh Wiggins, Darren Mann, Taylor Hickson, Kyle McLaughlin, and director Keith Berman. Hi. <laughs> Writer, director, excuse me. Uh, congratulations on this beautiful film. It is so wonderful. It sneaks up on you, I think. Uh, it feels, it, it starts, to, it feels initially like a teen film with a great soundtrack, and then it just peels back layer after layer, adding depth to the characters and I think humanity to them as well. Usually in teen movies, you don't get humanity. You get cardboard cutouts to fulfill stories that we've seen several times. And because this is not a story we've seen several times, we're able to go in much more original, heartfelt directions. I, I applaud you. A really wonderful film. Thank you very much. Um, how did this begin for you? How did you find the story? How did you start writing it? Where did the, uh, the spark come from? Uh, well, the initial spark, I need, do I need to use it? Kinda. The initial yeah. spark, the initial spark uh, came from, I had just finished a long-term meditation retreat. At that point in my life, I was doing a lot of meditating and a lot of meditating retreats. And uh, at the very end of that, I had a dream. Uh, and then... Shortly after that, I started writing the dream down. And the dream was a young man talking to his mother in the kitchen. That's all the dream was. Wow. And it just inspired me to write some thoughts and some notes. And I just kept, over the days that passed, I just kept going back to that idea and kept writing. Uh, and then it became clear that there was a film here, a story that I thought was um, important to tell that needed to be told. When you had this dream or this, this image of a, a, a kid sitting down with his mother, mm -hmm. did you have any idea what they were talking about or was it just the image and then you started hearing, you started writing their voices and yeah. suddenly a story started building out of there that? There were some words there. I can't remember what they said in the dream, but it, yeah. it's not actually in the film. You saw my face, right? I saw, I saw, That's what, I saw yeah. his face and I was like, there he is. Who is that man? I gotta put him in a movie. Um, yeah, it, it, like it, it, it evolved. I dreamt you. Yeah. I dreamt you. <laughs> and you ran away. I, it, it evolved over time. Yeah. The story became apparent over time, over you know, the months of writing. It wasn't clear from the beginning. You know, one of the things that I love about the film is that we never have a moment in the film where your character looks at someone and says, I don't know who I am, or I can't figure me out. And it's all left internal. And it makes, and I said this to you in the green room, it really makes you feel like everybody around him is struggling much worse with their identities than he is. He's confident, he's figuring it out, but he's not taking it out on anybody. Can you talk about developing this character and sort of not having that cathartic moment where you would have to verbalize or externalize everything going on with your character? 
yeah, I think Keith's writing uh, is all very authentic. So it's not, you know, this big moment of everybody's in your face. It's kind of his realization slowly builds over time with all these, you know, voices that he has around him. And he has Mouse's friend, which gives unique perspectives in his dad. And even though he shuts those out at first, it kind of, once he starts to come more at peace with himself, those ideas and, and that advice really can kind of feed into him and form who he is at the end. So, How do you find authentic moments and backstories for these characters that don't feel like explanations for who they are in the moment that we're, we're watching them or don't feel like excuses for who and what they are in the moments that we're watching them? Yeah, as I'm writing, I just tend to really want to write uh, stories and characters that slowly reveal themselves and they allow the audience to participate and think about it and discover it for themselves. Um, it's just more interesting to me. It's just what I do naturally. Um, yeah. Uh, you have, a, I think, an incredibly hard, difficult job in the film, which is, in some respects, being, for all intents and purposes, on paper the villain, but doing what the film requires, which is making a very sympathetic human villain that we are actually in a lot of pain with throughout the movie. Can you talk about creating that, crafting that character and come and, and sort of walking that thin line? Yeah, yeah, for sure. <clears throat> I mean, uh, you, you said you saw the film today, so there's that, f there's a f scene at the convenience store when things... It's really, heartbreaking. Yeah, it really comes to a head, and I, and I often say with that is that if he was just there simply, uh, you know, giving a butt kicking, that it wouldn't be very interesting, but it's so much deeper than that. He's really struggling with himself and battling himself the whole time. And this is truly the person he actually loves the most. But uh, he also really cares what other people think about him. So it's a real internal struggle for Ballast the whole time. And that's what was so fun about playing is that it's, there's so many layers to it. It was so dynamic. Well, so much of it is what we see on your face, too, because you can't say any of the things that your character may be feeling. And when it comes to that head at the convenience store, I don't want to spoil anything. What makes that scene so emotional is you know that this is something that neither of them want to be in the midst of, and they're, one of them is really doing it to the other one in that moment. But it's heartbreaking because you're watching two people really hurt each other and, or hurt themselves and hurt another person. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, can you talk about writing a movie like this in this for lack of a better way to put it, this day and age, where it feels like you don't have to easily categorize your characters, you don't have to box them in. I think people have attempted, not necessarily movies like this, but have attempted talking about um, sexuality, sexual fluidity in high school at young ages, but they always end up feeling as though, at the end of the movie, well, this person is now this, and that's ha and everybody's happy because they've come out and have finally boxed themselves in this other way. Can you talk about living in a time where you don't really have to write characters like that? Does it feel different? Well, I, I mean, I guess I think it is different in the sense that we are now becoming more accepting and more aware of the broader experience of who we are as people. Um, my interest in, in life and in, in the, the movies I make is just to really examine and explore who we are as human beings. And who we are as human beings are very rich, complex, layered uh, beings, you know? And um, life is that. Life is beautiful and full and mysterious. And I just wanted to make a film that really reflected that, you know? The movie's not really about who you love. It's about the experience of just loving, you know? Or it's not about how you identify or what label you have. It's just about the experience of actually being. That's ultimately what I wanted to get at. And at the very end, when you know Frankie's riding his bike, he's come through a lot and he's, he's, he's dealt with a lot and he's discovered a lot, but really what he's left with is, is wholeness. And he's left with him, himself not being fragmented. And that's, that was what I was, what I was going for. Um, Kyle, you're one of our greats. You've been in so many incredible movies and, and shows, and I think, you know, so many iconic roles, specifically Agent Cooper, obviously. Uh, but what you're so good at, especially in this film, is you have so few words in a number of scenes, but you depict so much backstory and so much intention and pain just by the look in your eyes or maybe just by what we know of you in the script. How do you go into a scene and how do you do that? A scene where you maybe have one or two lines, but we recognize that this is a person trying to get something that he can't achieve. Well, it starts with Keith and the writing and, and the quality of the words that my character has. And then you couple it with 
Josh's performance where I was speaking earlier that I didn't have to do a whole lot but react to him. And I'm a father myself now, and somehow that experience has had a tremendous impact on and had a tremendous impact on this performance. So all that coupled together um, seemed to work. And I was just grateful to have a character that, like the like the father, that that I think has has got a, a, a positive, uplifting uh, message for his son. You know, in a in a very gentle way. Um, this is a this is a delicate time for for kids. You know, and I think having having being able to represent an adult a parent who can um, who can support that in a, in his own way i think is a message um and a, and a and a well it's just really a character that we need to see more of so he's such a good dad because lots of dads have positive messages but they're like hear it listen to my no, positive message yeah and he's about and hearing he's holding back and waiting and then at the right moment yeah he's there to pounce with it yeah my father i had a very good role model in my dad you know and and he was very much about that and so i think it just it it's hopefully how i'm raising my son and, and it informed my performance to, to a great deal of kind of realizing how much it actually did as I watched the movie. I was like, oh, wow, this is very similar to my dad, just an understanding and stepping back a little bit and being there as just kind of a, a wall and a protection, you know what I mean, but, but supportive at the same time. I, I'm curious about your process in paring down the scenes because so much, and I think I've kind of referenced this or alluded to it in some of these questions, is that so much of what's great about your movie it's, is what's not in the movie. It's what's implied. It's what's happened before the movie started. So how much do you find of your writing gets tossed away by the time you get to your shooting draft? How much backstory have you written out? How, how, many, how often are scenes much longer and you find just this small amount of words that will actually tell the story? There is some of that that happens in the writing stages or the rewriting stages, and it also happens a bit in the editing stage. But I think I tend to write kind of sparsely anyway. Mm. Um, I think I tend to, you know, discover what the film or the scene is about. And, and um, I sit, I, I kind of just sit and I picture, like, what am I seeing? And then I just write exactly what I'm seeing. And, and it tends to be kind of, you know, uh, leaving a lot to the images. When I was younger, I, when I was in grade four, I decided I was going to be a novelist. And so when I was tw uh, 19 or 20, I was actually writing a novel. Wow. And I... I go. I had a, I was with a pen and, an, and my paper. I was writing it, and <laughs> after about a month of that, I was sitting one day in in my little office, and I was so frustrated that I couldn't write what I was seeing, and I actually literally said out loud, "Oh, if this was a movie, I would I would show that, I would show that, I would show that," and I I heard that, I went, "Oh, I should maybe look into making movies." So I started studying film, and it was the perfect medium for me because it's like you said, images. And just silence and space and time and looks. I love what looks can do, you know. Convey so much of our, our uh, the ineffable human experience, which is kind of, you know, often understated. Yeah. If I can say something, going back to his performance, of course. he talks about the writing and Josh, which is, I think, um, yeah, okay. Josh was fantastic. I think the script is good. <laughs> but he was Leave super, it there. Yeah, he was I'm super great. prepared. Uh, he, he, I kept one of his pages from his script, the script that he marked, oh, and you have that. I have, I'm gonna frame it one day. Uh, and I'll sell it on eBay if I have to, but uh, it was uh, a <laughs> great writing. It was great so writing. marked, it was like so, every word, he had some note, but almost every word he said, there was some note huh. about what he was, what the character was going through, or what he was, what was experiencing. So, I mean, you, you, you were incredibly prepared too, and you work very deeply. Well, the idea is you write it all, you know, your down and thoughts. As you see things, I, I, you, know, you feel things as an, as an actor, you write them down and then you just kind of, then it should become kind of an out of focus kind of thing that you sort of put away and then you, mm -hmm. you're left with, the, you're distilled that down. That's, there it is. That's the magic. Now you know my, my secrets. Yeah, give it away. Uh, you two have a beautiful uh, relationship uh, that develops about halfway through the film. Uh, incredibly supportive and tender. Uh, can you talk about developing that with, with, with Josh? I mean, Josh is an incredible on-screen partner. <laughs> I mean, uh, everyone's made the comment on that. Um, it's true. You can see it. Um, Josh, you're just such an awesome energy on set that I think just hanging out and all three of us hanging out, it, it was really easy to make that connection. And then 
bring aspects of that to screen. But um, that's how it was for me. I don't know about you. <laughs> <laughs> Quite the opposite. Taylor is really hard to work with. Uh, <laughs> Diva. <laughs> no, it's the same thing. I mean, you you have to get really lucky in a sense yeah. of when you start a project because if you're not, if you don't have a connection with the people that you're working with, the the relationship's not going to be there. Well, maybe yeah. not so lucky though, because <laughs> Keith put us through auditioning process for a year and a half to make sure we were the right people. That, that is, <laughs> is true. That true? That's true. Test, yeah. Yeah. I mean. Yeah, we spent a long time looking for the right people. Yeah. Um, Josh, actually, we actually offered the role to because uh, he had worked with uh, the producer of this film. Her name is Allison Black on another film called Mean Dreams, and <clears throat> she thought he was great, and I met him, and I thought he was great for the role. And then we did some auditioning. But um, Taylor and Bell, or Taylor and Darren, both stood out very early on, and we had them kind of flagged, and we then we just did some due diligence. Yeah, well, the, the auditioning process for me, I felt, was less about the the character and you more about getting to know us as as people and uh -huh. our stories, which I, I found really finding beautiful. The right, finding the right chemistry. You know, yeah. We, Allison and I spent a long time, you know, just building not only with the uh, um, cast, but the crew, mm -hmm. a, a group that was going to be a really um, great place to spend time and, and was, you know. How often do you did you guys find uh, that the script was very exacting or that you guys were also bringing a lot to, to him as well and sort of figuring out the scenes together. Uh, I'll say that... We had so much creative freedom. I, we, we, it was so much about a collaboration rather than us just depicting what was written. Yeah. I mean, working with Keith, I'll say, was extremely uh, special for me. Uh, he's so supportive, and you never are afraid to go to him with any questions or concerns or anything like or that. He's always, he's always down to listen and collaborate, and he wants mm -hmm. to work with you. Um, so it was really unique and special to get to work with Keith. 100%. Um, Josh, you're in every, for the most part, every frame of, of this movie. Uh, what was that like going into a project and doing that? Did that make you nervous at all? Um, I mean, not necessarily. Um, I think when you're comfortable with who you're working with and you're comfortable with the character that you're playing, because, I mean, like they're all saying, Keith is very easy to work with. It's, it's, it's a very collaborative process, and... There's always some fear going in as to how committed a director is going to be to the words. Uh, and Keith was much more uh, dedicated to the emotion of the words. So it's more, you know, you can go to him if, you're, if you have maybe a different idea of how it should be said or anything like that. So whenever a director creates an environment like that, it makes it much, much easier. And then working with, with all of them, it's, it's not it's super easy. It was, a, it was a very special set, I'll say that. It was extremely cohesive and... Uh, very well run and, and such a special experience to get to work on that film. The, the experience itself seemed something out of a movie. I remember when we were shooting our, our flare scenes, I think it was the 4th of July, so there was, we were, we were right across from Michigan and they had an insane budget for fireworks. There's fireworks until 4 in the morning, so while we were shooting the flares, we were out in the streets watching the, the fireworks. And There's just so many situations and experiences that happened throughout the film that just made it truly, it was magical. It was a magical set. And I've told you that so many times. Time, yeah. It's beautiful. How important was it? I mean, you kind of said this, but uh, when you were going through that year and a half, or I think, I think Taylor actually said it, how important was part of the audition process just trying to make sure that this was going to be a good time? Because making films is hard, and it can be long hours. Yeah, it's important to both Allison and I to have it be a good experience for everybody involved um, whenever possible. I mean, obviously, it's a very difficult process. You know, we don't have a lot of time, and you're you're out there in the world trying to m make this happen. Um, but you know, mostly, I mean, obviously, the the first priority is just getting people who are right for the roles, who really, I mean, who really want it, who really are, are going to bring something to it because they're really interested and engaged and curious about the role. Uh, and that's the, that's the, obviously the main priority. But it's also and also maybe understand it too. I mean, like we've kind of said, there's a lot of depth to these characters mm. that's not necessarily on the page, but is alluded to, and are not necessarily scenes that they have to deal with. You want to make sure that your actors kind of understand that and do their homework. Yeah, they, they understand it, and and they all really wanted that. I think they were all really, yeah. they really wanted these roles because they think they saw there was something to really explore in it. I think a lot of us had really intimate connections with the characters as well. I think we carried a lot of our pieces from our own lives. And just because the script was written so authentically, that it really allowed us to do that. But um, we, we talked a lot and found a lot of common, common connections with our characters and 
similarities in our stories. Yeah, I mean, it's not too often that you get to play a character uh, like Ballast that's so dynamic and layered in that age range. Mm -hmm. So when I saw that, uh, you know, I knew I had to do it, and I really, really wanted to do it. You're still empathetic and sympathetic with him, too, which is it's, it's a very tricky fine line between having the audience still love someone who's, who's made out to be a villain. For sure. No, I think that's one of the great successes of the movie is that you empathize with your character mm -hmm. throughout the whole thing. I mean, yours as well. <laughs> But yours, I mean, it's a tricky thing to make, as you said, to make someone empathize with your character when he starts doing the things that he does. But part of the heartbreak is knowing that he doesn't want to do these things. And I've already said this, but it's a great performance and yeah. it's a very, very well-rounded character. Hey. Uh, let's get some questions uh, from our audience. Who has a question? Right here. Well, guys, thank you for being here today. Um, as a gay viewer, I must say, we want to see stories like this. We need to see stories like this. And I'm really looking forward to seeing it right down the street at the Angelica. Uh, Keith, I want to ask you, you're from Saskatchewan. This film was uh, filmed in Ontario, premiered at Toronto. Would you say that there's um, a Canadian um, sensibility to this film in particular? And if so, how? Um, <clears throat> well, I don't know. I, 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 I think maybe some of the, what you're describing about the understatedness of it, perhaps, is maybe Canadian. Um, or maybe it's indicative of, of a lot of Canadian films, I think. Uh, and sometimes it really works and sometimes it doesn't work as well. But uh, perhaps that. Um, it's hard to, you know, it's, it's like when you're a goldfish swimming in a, a pond, or it's hard to know what that pond is. So, I mean, maybe uh, you did some research about Saskatchewan. Maybe you can do some more research and you can let me know. We'll if find it out. Is. Right. Yeah. I would say like a hallmark of uh, a stereotype of Canadians is that they're very nice. And everyone depicted in this movie is even though bad things happen, is very nice and is, you know, suffering under the weight of good intentions or bad feel or like bad feelings while having good intentions. Uh, that to me, that to me strikes me as Canadian, where most American films, like 95%, there's one person who's just totally evil that everybody has to battle. <laughs> yes, we, we find the good in everybody. You're, in yeah, Canada. you do. You're very oh. like, uh, one more. Hi, uh, so we've seen a lot of wholesome dads of teens on screen recently from Call Me By Your Name to eighth grade. Uh, why do you think that is and what does this story add to that trend? Uh -huh. uh, well, maybe as we evolve in our society now, maybe we are evolving the idea of masculinity so that it's uh, much broader. Men are now understand that they can be, they can have emotions, they can have feelings, they can communicate. So maybe that's, um, being reflected in these kinds of characters coming out. Um, I think the capacity for fathers and sons to relate to their emotions is uh, something that's you know evolved in the last generation. So that's probably, uh, and what this adds to it, I guess it just adds uh, another, another depiction of that, another take on that. Yeah, there isn't as great of a generational conflict, I think, in terms of va value systems, although I'm sure there is in, in a lot of homes, but while Kyle's the only parent here. The other parents are also f pretty good, sensitive people as well, doing their, doing their best. And none of the parents are people that you wouldn't want to have a conversation with as a teenager. Uh, one, oh, we have a question coming in from Twitter. Uh, it's for Kyle. Who is your favorite David Lynch character to play and why? <laughs> You'll never escape a David Lynch question in any interview. No, they, uh, that's OK. Who is my favorite David Lynch character? All of them. All of them are my favorites to play. I, would, I literally, we did this last. Twin Peaks, I, every morning I woke up at four in the morning and I was happy to get up and happy to go to work and happy to work with David and happy to work on a set that was very similar to the set that we had here where the environment is creative, positive, fun, and that there is great, there's, there's just great creative energy flowing all around and it's encouraged and, uh, and of course fueled by a lot of coffee, so. <laughs> David had pretty much, uh, after a certain point, had said I'm not gonna make movies or do things unless I am given complete creative control because I don't want the set to ever feel like anybody can't be totally creative and do the craziest, funniest, weirdest thing, right? I've always felt that way with, with all, everything that we've done together, you know, through the years, but, um, yeah, when you're David Lynch, um, you you know you pretty much tell it like it is, and you get left alone. You get left alone, but 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 more more than that, it's like um, you know go against that at your peril because um, what David is going to create is going to be incredibly powerful, and you just have to let him do his thing. 
Do you get more nervous playing something like, um, you know, Agent Cooper's doppelganger who's vomiting or beating people up or doing crazy stuff or doing a tender scene like you have with Josh where you really have to land that that moment and a lot of the movie kind of anchors on the this they're, one moment. They're both they're both challenging, you know. You try to bring your best game to each situation and uh and I think the challenge in our film was just to make it as simple and uh real in the moment as possible and we approached it very gently, you know, and all the work had been done in prior scenes between the two of us and and uh and it just it just unfolded very naturally and again i credit the writing on that um and josh again for for creating the reality be between the i think you really bought the fact that father and son and so what the payoff was very satisfying i think um, guys, congratulations. It's a wonderful film. It comes Thank out uh, March 15th. Uh, people can see it. No? No. March 1st, here. March 1st, here. Uh, oh. Tomorrow at the Angelica. Oh, the March 15th up there. Guys, it comes out tomorrow at the uh, Angelica. I love it. It's such a wonderful, tender portrait of, of youth. We rarely get to see in an incredible form, performance at the center. But everybody give them a huge round of applause for Giant Little Ones. Let's hear it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.